again for having me. Organizers, Stockholm is one of my favorite cities in the world with uh, many friends, so thank you. Uh, this paper, uh, this is the first time I'm presenting it to an academic audience. I've presented it to practitioners, but not academics, so please, you know, fire away. I'm you know, very curious to, uh, to get comments. Uh, one thing, though, no cue. There is, there is no cue, so I'm consistent. So uh, what's, uh, what's going on in this paper? Well, there's a, a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence and stories about what to look for in a CEO and what makes a CEO successful, but there's a lot less systematic, large sample empirical work because it's hard to get the right data, and I'll, I'll be clear about that uh, as we go along. And, you know, why is this about governance? Well, you know, the CEO is really important for running a company, and it's important for boards and shareholders to get right both who becomes a CEO and who are your potential CEO candidates, and that's what this paper uh, is about. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about what we know about CEOs from the economics and management literature. I'm going to talk about what our research does, and this is work with Morten Sorensen, uh, who's in Copenhagen, and we, uh, we have a very nice data set of assessments of C-level executives uh, where we have 2,600 assessments. Uh, it's a big extension from a paper I wrote with uh, Morton and uh, Mark Klebanoff a few years ago where we had just 316 CEOs. So I'm going to talk about what are the characteristics of these different executives, who gets hired, and then whether these assessments uh, predict things out of sample and then I'll talk about what I think the implications are. So literature, you know, economic theory, there are a lot of theories that say CEOs are the same or have the same ability. Uh, those are not relevant here. Uh, there are other papers that say CEOs have different talents and abilities, and the more ability you have, the more value you have. Uh, Gebex and Landier is probably the more recent one to do that. Uh, but they don't tell us what ability is. Uh, ability is just A, and more A is better. Um, and then uh, there are some other papers uh, that focus on particular characteristics. Patrick uh, has a paper where he kind of looks at resoluteness uh, and overconfidence versus uh, the opposite, and uh, they make some predictions uh, that, you know, in that case, that that's a good thing. So that's the theory. Uh, empirical work, early work, uh, did a few things. First of all, Bertrand and Shore, I, you're laughing, the theorists are laughing that I went through the theory so quickly. Well, I'm an empiricist, okay. <laughs> um, glad Patrick is, uh, or else are not discussing. Okay. Um, so uh, then uh, the early empirical work, uh, Bertrand and Shore find that executives are different from each other. Uh, but they don't really tell you how they're different, just that they're different. Uh, then you have a series of papers, Momendi and Tate and others, uh, who, who look at, again, one, one version of ability or, or characteristic, in this case overconfidence, and try to turn, uh, tie that to firm decisions and outcomes. But again, it's not exactly ability, it's a, it's a particular characteristic. And more recent work is getting a little bit closer. Uh, Renee, uh, who's here, uh, has a nice data on everybody in Sweden who's 18 who has to take a test, and then she finds out who's a CEO, and it turns out the CEOs uh, are stronger on cognitive and non-cognitive tests at 18. Uh, in larger companies, have more talented CEOs. So that that sort of getting to ability, it's cognitive and non-cognitive, but it's it's measured uh, at 18. Uh, and then there's a recent perk paper that that tries to figure out extraversion. Uh, again, which is one characteristic from earnings conference calls and finds that that's uh, correlated with uh, becoming a CEO and getting paid more. So that's kind of the, the state of play in the economics literature. The management literature is huge, and so you've got things like good to great, you've got things like, uh, that's Bill George, who's sort of true north, and uh, Jeff Pfeffer, who has leadership BS. So there are all these uh, theories out there that again are theories and don't have uh, a lot of data to them. The empirical work in the management literature tends to use publicly observable measures like job tenure, college attended career path, uh, or use very small samples you know, for, for very specific um, 
kinds of places. So, so none of these papers really gets uh, much of a handle on parts of ability, and that's what we're going to try to do in this paper. So let me tell you about the assessments that I'm using. So the assessments are performed by an outside firm, GH Smart, and GH Smart, you know, their business is to assess management candidates. So they don't get paid any more or less if the person is hired. Uh, they are just paid for the assessment. And they're typically recruited by the employer uh, or investor who's thinking of investing in a business. So I have private equity uh, companies that are looking at CEOs. I have venture capital companies. I have public companies. We have, you know, it's a sample of many different kinds of companies. And what they do is, is they do a four-hour structured interview with the person. Uh, I've, I've talked to executives who've gone through this, and uh, one of them uh, said it was like a proctology exam, uh, <laughs> that uh, they, uh, they, they go through four hours in, in great detail, and uh, they get a lot of information. Uh, when they're done, there's like a 20 to 40 page document uh, which has detailed information on the candidate. And what's nice for us is they rate the candidates on like at least 40 specific things, 30 of which get used across the entire sample. And we're going to take these 30 different ratings and that's what we're going to work with. And um, the ratings are letter ratings, so we're going to code up A or A plus as a four, B plus, uh, sorry, A minus is a three, B plus is a two, and B or below is a one. It doesn't, we played around with different uh, parameterizations of that, and it doesn't really affect the results. Uh, here are the assessed characteristics, and they're kind of all over the place. Leadership, uh, personal, intellectual, motivational, interpersonal, and, um, you know, some of these, you know, you'll see some of these are probably correlated, which... Uh, we're going to have to deal with later, but you know these are the 30 things that are rated across all the executives. Now, how do they how do they assess them? Well, what they'll do is you know say for higher A players, based on this four-hour interview, uh, they will rate the person as you know really good at doing that or not, based on the specifics that the candidate tells them. And, uh, you know, a candidate who can specifically say, I hired this person, I hired this person, I hired this person, is going to score higher uh, than somebody who can't. And similarly on uh, the other dimensions. And those are four of the dimensions, but they're, you know, as I said, there are 30. And uh, are the assessments reliable? I won't spend a huge amount of time on this other than to say uh, we think these assessments are reliable, external assessments tend uh, to be more reliable in uh, psychological work than self-assessments. And uh, we know that uh, GH Smart charges more than, you know, it's at least $10,000, and I think it's more now for one of these assessments, so they're uh, not cheap. Their business has been growing, and so, you know, presumably somebody uh, thinks these are reliable. And I would just say to the extent they're, they're not reliable, they're noisy, and uh, we should find uh, noise rather than uh, a result. So uh, here's what's in the data set. We have interviews uh, by year, and you can see that uh, the interviews, most of them took place 2001 to 2011, and that's going to be good because we're going to be able to follow these people three or four years after the interview. And uh, you can see you know, roughly 30% of the people are uh, CEOs, and then there's a smattering, there's 13% uh, you know, or so CFOs, some COOs, uh, other C-level people, and uh, then there are uh, investors and uh, people at a level below the C-level. And uh, here's uh, just some descriptive data uh, on the... Uh, candidates, they tend to have been working at the company for five years. Uh, they've worked for the company a long time for the most part. And uh, we do have women. We have about 10% women, uh, which we'll also be able to, to do something with. Uh, the last thing is insiders. About half of these people are insiders. They work for the company that's interviewing them. And uh, the 
other slightly more than half are outsiders, and then uh, hired, uh, you know, roughly, you know, 60 percent uh, of the people who are interviewed are hired, so we're going to get some variation on who is hired. Uh, corporate governance, this actually I, I could have done better, but about slightly less than half of the sample is buyout, uh, another chunk, you know, there's some growth equity, and uh, about 12% of the sample is public companies. So it's more private equity and venture than public, but we do have some public companies which we didn't have in the prior paper. Uh, this is just who gets hired, and, and what it, it says here is that uh, insiders are more likely to be hired. It's the outsiders where uh, there's a lot of variation, and some of that is that the insider is running the company, and uh, the private equity firm is looking at somebody uh, who is already running the company. So, uh, one thing that we, we did is, before we looked at any of the data, you know, we had to have research assistants go and code this up. And after the research assistants had read the assessments, we, we asked them to just give their impressions of the CEOs. Uh, because we figured we would then map this into, you know, our quantitative analysis and see what happened. And so, uh, you can see we asked them if, uh, if the person seemed to be a nice person. Uh, if, uh, and that's very, I know that's very analytical and very objective, but this is, this is a subjective thing. Uh, we asked if the person was a risk taker. Uh, personality means extroverted, uh, good at sales, and then career path is, is narrow versus broad. So those were the things we asked, and this is, this is the RA, so this is a, you know, an undergraduate, uh, you know, several undergraduates who were coding this up. So these are average scores. You can't read it, but it doesn't matter. So here's what we, here's what we did. Basically, the, the scores are correlated. So somebody who scores high tends to score high on a bunch of other things. And so you wouldn't want to run all 30 variables in a regression because you would get multicollinearity. And, and fortunately, Bernie, Bernie saved me because Bernie did this too, and he explained why he did it, so I don't need to, no, just joking. So basically, you're doing a factor analysis, which is similar to a principal components, where what we're doing is we're taking these 30 variables and reducing the dimensionality and turning it into variables that explain the variation. And it turns out there are four factors in the data that seem to have explanatory power in the sense that they have eigenvalues above one, which this literature says uh, means they're you know, explanatory. The really nice thing about these four is that the first two are exactly the same two that Morton and I found in our first paper when we just had 316 CEOs. And now what's nice, now we have 2,600 people of all kinds, and those first two factors are there plus an additional two. So, what are the factors? So, first factor, factor one is general ability, because basically all these ratings load positively, and uh, you know, so the higher you score on everything, the higher uh, the factor is, so we call that general ability. The second one is interpersonal versus execution. So controlling for the talent, you explain a lot of variation by whether the person has strong interpersonal skills, and interpersonal is treats people with respect, open to criticism, listening skill, and teamwork, versus execution skills, which is aggressive, moves fast, holds people accountable. And uh, I'm going to call that variable the execution, vary or execution factor, and that has a, a negative sign on it. Uh, factor number three, analysis versus charisma. And uh, the charisma part is basically high on enthusiasm, persuasion, aggressive, and proactive. And the opposite of that was being kind of analytical. Um, <laughs> why is that so funny? Yeah, I guess, all right, this is an analytical audience. Okay, but this factor four is better, strategic, creative. We're all strategic and creative. <laughs> Um, versus managerial, and so this factor positive was 
uh, high grades on strategic, creative, and brain power versus people who are kind of de attention to detail, organized, uh, et cetera. So, so these are the four factors that come out of the data. And uh, what was really cool, now I'm going to show you how the different class of the different jobs score on these four factors. And I'm starting out with candidates. And then we'll see who gets hired. So the candidates are, no, I didn't, sorry, I'm not going to do that yet. First, I'm just going to show you these are the factors, which you can't read. But this is actually very cool. We looked at the correlation of our factors with what the RAs said about these people before they'd seen anything, just reading the narrative. And what's very cool is that, for example, nice person, what is that most correlated with? That is most correlated with execution. It is negatively correlated with execution, which means it's positively correlated with interpersonal. Let's see. Risk taker is execution and charisma. And actually, good at sales is very correlated with charisma. So what was really nice about this is that the variables um, or the factors are very, you know, correlated with kind of intuitively how our RAs thought about these people. And now I'm going to run through the results. Uh, here are the average factor scores for the executives. And what you see here, CEOs score high on talent, they score high on execution, they score high on charisma, and they score high on strategic creative. The CFOs are exactly the opposite. And uh, it's, uh, it's fun to, uh, you know, I presented this to a group of CFOs, which was, uh, it was kind of fun. Um, so uh, there we go. CEO candidates are different. And, uh, and the public company executives actually were more talented uh, across the board than the others. So that was uh, consistent with uh, Renee's paper. Um, which ones get hired? So this was saying, take the candidates and then see what gets you hired. And it turns out that the people who are hired are, to some extent, more talented, but it's the more interpersonal people. So it's that direction. But the more interpersonal people get hired, even though the candidates, you know, particularly for the CEOs, they're more execution-oriented, the ones who get hired are the ones who are better on the interpersonal. They're still... They're still high on execution once you're hired, but they're not as high as the candidates. So, uh, and there's not much of a difference on uh, charisma and creative strategic. So this just shows that uh, uh, in numbers, and this, you know, we ran some regressions to see, you know, if we put in controls and we have industry fixed effects, we have uh, year fixed effects, and basically those results pretty much hold uh, that that's who gets hired, that the interpersonal gets you hired. Becoming a candidate, different things make you a candidate versus once you're a candidate, what gets you hired. Um, insiders and outsiders, I'll skip. It's stronger on outsiders than insiders. Um, so CEOs are different uh, and uh, higher, once you're a candidate, higher talent and interpersonal skills uh, get you hired. And that's not just for CEOs, it's for all C-level positions. Uh, now, last thing we did was, two minutes, I'll, I'll get there. So the last thing we did is, is you might, yeah, you, know, you worry about this, that let's say you're GH Smart, you interview a CEO, and you expect the CEO to be charismatic, creative, strategic, et cetera. It may be that, you know, the, uh, it's somewhat self-fulfilling how these people are rated versus, um, you know, their uh, job uh, classification. So what we did is we took the people who were not CEO candidates and we followed their careers, and it turns out some of them were CEOs. And what we run is a regression where we try to predict who becomes a CEO based on their ratings when they were interviewed for something that was not a CEO job. And uh, what do we find? We find exactly what we found in the first sample. The people who are more likely uh, to become CEOs are more talented, they're higher on execution, they are more charismatic, and they're somewhat more 
strategic, creative. And uh, again, you can control for lots of things, and uh, it uh, comes out the same. The one thing that is uh, here that uh, you know, I, uh, I kind of wish weren't here is that women are less likely to subsequently become CEOs. That there was no difference in the women uh, in the, the, the ratings, but then on the subsequent CEOs, women uh, are less likely to become CEOs. So, uh, I'll summarize. So what do we find? We have these assessments. And uh, first of all, characteristics are described by these four factors. And uh, the interpretations are consistent with the subjective assessments. Uh, CEO candidates and hires are different. Uh, but getting hired, the interpersonal skills matter. Uh, Non-CEO candidates who look more like CEOs are more likely to become CEOs and uh, holding characteristics constant, women are less likely to become CEOs. What does it mean? CEOs and executive characteristics can be measured. The results suggest that uh, CEOs are different, that top management characteristics are, you know, in some sense, complements, not substitutes. Uh, controlling for characteristics, women are less likely to become CEOs. Is that discrimination or labor supply? Don't know. Um, Speculation or future work. Um, just let me finish the slide and I'll be done. Um, what determines success? So the previous paper, execution determines success. We want to do that with this sample. Um, if execution determines success and the people who are hired are less execution oriented, more interpersonal, uh, that suggests that boards may overweight interpersonal skills. And I will leave the others for uh, later, and uh, thank you, and I will sit down and hear my discussion. Excellent. I, um, I have to start with a caveat um, that uh, Alan and Merritt started with yesterday, which is that I'm a law professor. Um, I enjoy theory. Uh, I deal with empirical stuff when I have to, and today is one of those days when I may actually have to uh, delve into this. Um, Of course, I want to thank the organizers. It's a great privilege uh, to be uh, able to comment on this paper. Uh, thank Stephen and his co-author um, for all the work that they put into the paper. Um, maybe as an outsider, where I start with, I have a bit of trepidation. Um, because when I received this paper um, in Singapore, my first reaction when I opened up the email was, isn't this boring? Um, and the reason why I thought this is so boring is I was totally unaware of the literature. Um, but when you think about it, the question of are CEOs different, I thought that that is patently obvious. Um, in the sense that in every jurisdiction in the world, um, companies have one CEO. CEOs get paid more money uh, than any other worker. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, uh, but for good reason. CEOs, by definition, have a different job than anyone else in the company. So you would think, naturally, um, that CEOs, in fact, um, are, are different. Um, and then when you think of the, the, the CEOs in this world, and Trump comes up yet once again, um, when you look at these faces, um, you don't think uh, that these people um, are the same. You don't think that they're the same um, in terms of their management style. You don't think they're the same as the person on the street. Um, you don't think they're the same as other people in their company. Indeed, you probably don't think that they're the same um, as CEOs between each other, right? And um, that's why I actually think the opposite about this paper, which is the interesting findings, I think, um, and maybe it's because I totally have missed uh, uh, the empirical analysis and I'm not aware of the literature, aside from what I've read over the past week or so. Um, the interesting findings, I think, are all about sameness. Um, and the fact that CEOs would have four similar characteristics, that you could look at the universe of CEOs and say that they have four similar characteristics, I think is something that's quite fascinating and isn't readily apparent. I mean, this comes from the earlier paper that Stephen talks about, where uh, he pulled a quote out from uh, Drucker, a much earlier um, analysis of this, where uh, he said, effective executives differ widely in their personalities, strengths, weaknesses, values, and beliefs. All they have in common is they get the right things done. Um, so the idea, um, in fact, uh, 
that CEOs have some similar characteristics, I think is what is exciting and interesting about this paper. That you can actually identify these four features, and you can look at them, and you can say, we can now measure CEOs. And this is why I think it is, in fact, a terrific and exciting analysis. Because if we can say that we know of four features, um, what can we do? We can predict um, which candidates may become CEOs. Uh, as Stephen quite accurately mentions at the end of his paper, we could even try to train people up and say, can you improve on these characteristics to become a CEO? Um, also, other elements of sameness in the paper are the fact that the results are, are qualitatively similar regardless of size of company. And what else surprised me in terms of sameness is ownership style doesn't matter. So Stephen looked at private equity, venture cap, uh, public companies, and these four factors hold true regardless of ownership structure. Why is this important? Again, I won't go over the data because Stephen did, but it's all in the data, right? In the literature, there's been a lot of smaller studies. There's a lot of airport books that talk about what makes a great CEO. Um, but it's very hard to get at the data. And this is the wonderful thing, is, is the data set here. And it's this GH Smart firm, and Stephen's already described what GH Smart is, so I won't go over it again. Um, but this, as a, as a theoretical person, forced me to go back into the data. And this is where I have some questions uh, for Stephen um, that, that I think uh, can be elaborated on a bit. Um, we know one question I had was who goes to GH Smart? What type of companies go to GH Smart? And who goes to GH Smart are, as you can see from the quote, uh, venture cap firms, uh, growth and equity, uh, bio firms. But importantly, in this larger sample size compared to Stephen's past paper, it extends to private and public companies. Then I went on the GH Smart webpage. And the first thing, this is, the, this is what pops up when you, you go on the page. It says, leadership advisors uh, to the leaders of the world. Okay? And then what I wondered is, well, when they say leaders of the world, do they really mean this? And they do. They say that, uh, and this is a quote, GH Smart uh, consultants have provided trusted advisory services to our clients on six out of seven continents. I will forgive them for, for not having clients in Antarctica. Um, uh, but indeed, they, they, they claim that they're doing this for companies all over the world. But when I read the paper, being in Singapore, and this being the GCGC, my question was, have they looked at where these companies come from? And in the paper, it doesn't talk about this um, at all. And I think this could be the most fascinating finding, or at least one of them. Um, if they do, in fact, find that these four factors hold true, regardless of the region or the jurisdiction of the company, then they're going to show that we truly have this universe of global CEOs. Um, conversely, if they show that there is a statistical difference between companies from different countries, um, then you may be looking at culture playing quite a, a large role. And then I wanted to have a bit more fun on the internet. So what I did is I went on the GH Smart site um, and, and, and I started to look for if they had any Japanese companies, because I'm familiar with Japan, or Singaporean companies. Uh, they claim to do business in Singapore, but I couldn't find, at least on the webpage, any Singaporean companies. But I did find a Japanese company. And what made me think about the Japanese company was this, uh, from Stephen's uh, statistics. Um, the average uh, person uh, in, in, in Stephen's statistics um, had an average working span at the company, candidates, of 4.9 years. 60% okay? um, who were being considered to be CEOs were outsiders. When I read that, I thought you couldn't construct statistics which were more opposite than Japan. Okay. In Japan, the statistics, and I don't have them, but I, I, I would bet on these, and I ch checked them with Kanda-sensei uh, over lunch, and, and he tended to agree, it would likely be that the average candidate had 30 years of experience. And 99% are um, internal uh, candidates. And why is this interesting? Because on GH Smart's webpage, they have Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Um, Takeda Pharmaceuticals is the largest Japanese pharmaceutical company, one of the largest 12 in the world. And when I saw this, I thought, this is an interesting fact. Why? Because I'll put up the picture of the CEO from Takeda. Uh, 
<laughs> Now, even if you haven't been to Japan, <laughs> you may realize that this is an outlier, right? And sure enough, I went to check the statistics because I go to Japan very often, but、uh, surely less than 1% of Japanese listed companies have a non Japanese CEO. So, what does this tell me? This tells me, well, the foreign companies that go to GH Smart, yes, there may be lots of them, but these are not representative. Japanese companies do not use a company like GH Smart to hire their executives. Why? Because they probably maybe have different characteristics, right? And so if Stephen did take my advice and were to actually see if country of jurisdiction made a difference, I think he would still find sameness. He would find his four factors. But it would be because very strange. Foreign companies end up going to GH Smart. And so that would really tell us nothing, I think.、Um, so that is one thing、um, that I considered.、Um, another point which was interesting is that he looks at different types of companies. So public companies,、um, uh, private equity,、um, uh, and venture, ca venture cap. What he doesn't look at, which I thought would be fascinating in his 2,600 samples, are family firms. You know, if we think of four characteristics of CEO, and, and, and we'll just take the top one ability, I would think clearly, especially with second generation CEOs in family firms, you may not find that the characteristic of ability、um, would play out as much in the second generation family firm. Now, I assume with 2,600 uh, 2, observations,、um, you likely have family firms. If you don't have family firms, you have another problem. Which is that this isn't representative of the market at all, right? And so I think you need to、uh, take a look at that.、Um, public companies、uh, looks at public companies, but doesn't look at the difference in shareholder structure between these public companies. It would be nice to know if we're dealing with dispersed versus controlled companies. SOEs. Now I couldn't find any SOEs on there.、Um, maybe this is because. All of the observations are indeed from、uh, the United States, and GH Smart has this other data set that he can get his hands on with their global work.、Um, but certainly, when I think of CEOs,、um, going back to Curtis's talk、uh, in China,、uh, I think you would find very different characteristics、um, uh, of SOE CEOs、uh, than you would、um, in the four characteristics、uh, that are put out、uh, above. I also think that there's a, a, another problem, and now I'm shifting gears a bit. With the way that this data was collected,、uh, these were the,、uh, the, the, the proctology exams.、Um, but I wouldn't quite characterize it in that fashion, right? If you think of the scenario of these interviews, you have a four hour interview, and then you, you are interviewing people for what? To get a job. And you're saying, please describe your skills to me, okay? I think we have a serious risk here of misdescription in the positive direction. Okay, and, and Stephen recognizes this to be very fair in the paper,、um, but then goes on to say this if the assessment were uninformative, and by uninformative he means if the people were gaming the system,、uh, there would be no relationship between the assessment and the subsequent performance, which he found in his previous paper. But I don't know if I agree with that.、Um, I actually think that being able to, what he calls, game an interview. Is actually a valuable skill for a CEO, <laughs> which is I can sit in the interview and I can convince you that I have great skill and talent,、um, that I'm a strategic thinker. No, I may not be at all, but I think that could be a great proxy, in fact, for CEOs being able to perform on the job. And, and Stephen looks at the psychology literature, and I had a bit of a look at the psychology literature. It's of a different nature. You know, if you ask me, To, to be interviewed to, to tell you about my basketball skills、uh, to play for the Golden State Warriors, I'm not going to lie to you probably and tell you I sink 90% of my、uh, three, three throw shots、uh, um, when I don't because I will get caught easily and it's very easy to see if I'm gaming the test. But clearly, see, and, and the psychology literature had to do with military personnel, where you have very specific things that if you're talking about your physical abilities, it's a lot harder to game. Uh, you're a lot more cautious, I think. It's a lot harder to verify if you've gamed, right? And so I think there's a lot more noise. I, I don't think it accounts for everything, but I do think this is a much more noisy factor、um, than maybe、uh, Stephen is, is, is giving credit to.、Um, I'm almost out of time, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end on this factor.、Um, factor analysis, first time I've ever come across it at all.
um, I found it very interesting, but a little bit curious. Um, and what I found curious about it was you have the 30 factors, and of course you have too many factors to do regression, um, so you, you're trying to look for covariance, and then he identified four factors that covary together quite well. And that's all fine, and the 30 factors are defined very well when you, when you look at the chart. But where I found a problem was especially in the second factor. After you get the factors, you have the four factors, then you need to attach a descriptive label to that factor. The label is entirely arbitrary at that point. You could come up with any label that you, you want. Of course, if it's totally off key, people are going to see it and say this is misdescriptive. But when people are reading the abstract, that's what they see. The one descriptive variable that I thought was maybe a bit off, all of them I thought were quite good descriptions, except for the probably the most important one, which is interpersonal skill and agreeableness. And in the paper, actually, Stephen, the first time that Stephen and his co-author talk about um, uh, uh, this variable, they actually put interpersonal skill and then, in brackets, agreeableness. But throughout all the rest of the paper, they call it interpersonal skill. And why I think agreeableness would be better is a few reasons. One is, if you go in the psychology literature, there is five big um, uh, important personality traits, and you find a lot of literature on this. Agreeableness is one of them. Interpersonal skill is not. When you look at the, at the factors, they tend to look more like agreeableness, and the trade-off, I think, is a lot more clear. If you're talking on a continuum between execution ability and agreeableness, I think it's a lot more intuitive. When you start talking about interpersonal skill and execution ability, I think it becomes um, not as intuitive, meaning that execution skill, um, linguistically, probably, uh, interpersonal skill has a lot to do with executing. Um, and on that, I am out of time. Um, again, as a non-expert, I apologize if this was all totally ignorant and useless. Uh, but I thank Stephen very much for an excellent paper, and again, the organizers for in inviting me here. Thank you. Hello, Tom. No, it's just a, a very simple question. The, you, you basically have the ranking of, these, of these, all these people in your sample relative to each other, but how do they rank relative to the general population? The, C, the CEO may well be, even, even, e, even if a person is agreeable, you know, uh, compared with other, 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 other uh, people in your sample, relative to the human race, they may be incredibly aggressive. Thank you. So, um, great paper. The discussion um, brought up, I, I, I think, um, I wonder, something that you might want to explore. It would be easy to explore. One of the differences across countries that people emphasize uh, in terms of culture is whether uh, the country has a uh, collectivist culture or an individualist culture. And leadership styles, I think that's what the uh, discussant was alluding to. Leadership styles um, differ depending whether you are in a collectivist culture or in an individualist culture. Now, it seems like you have enough variation across countries and therefore across cultures to be able to tease that out from your, from your data. I, I wonder. <laughs> I have a question about what we are really learning here. Uh, I mean, uh, talent. These are more talented people. I mean, of course, I mean, I mean, this is something we would have expected, but what is talent? And uh, you could say, okay, I'm measuring it. Okay, but uh, um, I mean, it would be maybe more interesting rather than simply saying that these are more talented than, than, than others who do not become CEOs to see how much, for instance, their uh, uh, later uh, pay, for instance, loads on talent rather than, say, other uh, characteristics or, or maybe characteristics of the company and stuff like that. I mean, that would be, I think, a more worthwhile uh, exercise than simply showing that these are more talented because, I mean, this is something we would expect that generally these are more talented people than others. I don't think the literature would question that. So, 
in effect, you're, you're building uh, aggregates out of the principal factors, mm -hmm. right? Principal component ac analysis for the non-experts is almost the same thing. I confess, I don't really understand the difference. Maybe Steve they're, does. They're, they're, very, um, they're very similar. Morton does. Um, but w in corporate governance, we don't think that independent directors necessarily mean the same thing in different countries. Going from zero to one in Brazil doesn't mean the same thing as going from six to seven in the U.S. Uh, for uh, GS Smart, they're presumably using native interviewers. Could, could, I, could I just stop this conversation right now? There are no international observations in this sample. So the ah, international okay. expansion is after this, was after 20... 11 or 12 when we had most of our interviews. So it's a great question. It's something I would like to explore, but it's not in the data. So question it's answer. not an issue. It, it, it's not an issue and it is an issue, you know, both. All right, I have um, three questions. Um, so uh, one question that the management literature looks at is whether uh, talent is sort of innate or acquired. And I was wondering if you could actually get at this, like if you know the position of the person before being appointed CEO, uh, whether you could somehow look at, um, you know, whether people who hold different positions actually have different characteristics. Um, and I think that would be really interesting. Uh, my second question is, um, uh, like in Australia, when we hire faculty members, we always pretend um, that we don't know who we want to hire, and we put straw men into the group. Um, and, uh, you know, so you have a bunch of people who uh, you know are not going to be uh, uh, hired, right, because they come from, like, Bangladesh or, you know, some university. Um, and so then you lo and behold, appoint the internal candidate uh, because they compare very favorably to the other candidates. Um, so I'm wondering if you know uh, the set of candidates uh, who are uh, applying for the same position. That might be interesting to see whether there's strawman in there. Um, and finally, I think the gender effects are pretty interesting. Um, so obviously it'd be interesting to know whether you know the gender of the interviewer. And um, also if you could do an experiment with your RAs um, where you, like I wonder, do the RAs see the gender of the person they're coding when they say this is a nice person or not? And um, if they don't, maybe you should do an experiment uh, where you see whether it matters that they see, you know, the name of the person they're coding and see whether that makes a difference for um, how they characterize the characteristics. So this is actually related to Dan's question, but it's domestic. And I also had questions about exactly who is uh, being uh, interviewed by GH Smart as opposed to the sort of general population of applicants for these positions. And I mean, you know, because I assume that when Michael Eisner brought uh, Ovitz in at Disney, that he didn't go through this GH Smart interview. I don't know, maybe he did. Um, but, <laughs> I don't you know, think so. <laughs> it, it didn't show up in those hundreds of pages of, of decisions. Um, but, you know, in, in other words, is there a difference? And the reason I raise it is there is some, at least anecdotal, evidence that the director candidates who are the product of these search firms are quite different from the director candidates that um, are elevated based on, you know, personal relationships, connections, and so forth. And I wonder if you have any information on that. Okay, you ready? So uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, they were quite humorous. Uh, and uh, thanks for all the questions. So first of all, the international thing, you know, as I said, there are no international uh, companies or no not this is basically a US sample which we should have said uh, it's a real question whether this would work outside the US I, I can tell you I have talked to European assessment firms who uh, like my research and want to use it because they think it works in Europe and they think it works in the US Asia I don't know although I think uh, Hideki Kanda is here we were at lunch and Hideki Kanda was saying this should work in Japan Okay, there we go. So, Eamon, that's, that's my rebuttal there. Um, do, we, uh, do we have uh, family firms? You know, that's what's interesting. A lot of these PE firms are actually family, you know, it's a founder. So, I, don't know, I wouldn't call it, it's not the second generation, probably, so I'm not sure. But in those cases, give us a lot of variation, actually, in the other paper, because those people, people tend to get hired because they're with the firm and they make the investment. And that's where you get a lot of variation, like they're less skilled on these, these measures, and those are the ones that don't perform. So actually that works out uh, to the extent that 
uh, the results are here. They actually drive the results and actually uh, is, is validating to what we do. Now, the noising it up, you know, gaming the system, uh, I have two responses to that. You kind of said they're gaming and sort of saying they have these skill or, or making the interviewer think they have these skills and then we're finding they're successful. So it's kind of, it seems to me um, like that's just fine because if you're, as a board, what you're trying to do is find someone who's going to be successful or find someone who's going to be a CEO. This is doing uh, exactly what you want it to do. And um, so I, I'm not granting that they don't figure this stuff out, but even if, if they were noising it up in that way, I'm not quite sure uh, it matters here. Um, Let's see, so um, the, uh, the factors uh, are correlated with the, uh, uh, the RAs. Oh, so this is your, your thing on interpersonal versus agreeableness. I think that's, that's reasonable, so I will uh, not say that. Now the other comments. Um, Tom, rank relative to others, we don't know. This is a sample clearly of, of high achieving people. So I don't know how they are relative to others. Renee's work suggests they're high achieving. And so this was within a high achieving group. This is uh, how we think CEOs are different from others. Um, Marco, you know, of course they're more talented. Marco, that's the theorist's answer. You just said talent, you have no idea what it is. What this paper is about is saying, how do you measure it? How do you distinguish between, you know, if they're a 4-0 and you know, they have a whatever test score you want at the top versus somebody who's got great execution skills, you have no idea which of those two things matter. And in fact, the literature had no idea which of those things mattered more. And that's really why we did this paper is because this literature, whether it's the, the econ literature or the uh, management literature is all over the place and says everything matters or nothing matters. And what's nice about this paper is we can begin to say, here's what we think matters. Is it, you know, the last word on all this? Absolutely not. There's, you know, there's, you know, as you can see in everybody's uh, talking about the possible problems, but it is, there's so much more here than in, in my opinion than in anything else out there and it's a start. And what you want to do is keep going from here, and hopefully uh, I'll be able to, to do that. Uh, and then Renee, uh, had, uh, those were all good questions. Uh, innate versus acquired, I don't know. Um, it's clearly some must be innate because it's predictive, and it's predictive both in the, the paper with Morton, the execution predicts performance, and then in this paper, your characteristics at interview for a non-CEO job predict whether you'll become a CEO. So, so some of that at least is innate when they were interviewed. Whether you could, you know, if you're 25, whether you can work on it, or if you're 40, whether you can work on it, I don't know. I mean, I have opinions, but, you know, you can't tell uh, from the data. And then, um, uh, oh, are there candidates who are straw, straw men or women? Um, the fact is that the, on the private equity side, they are paying real money for each candidate. And it's the PE firms that drive the interviews. So at least on the PE firm side and the venture firm side, it would be you know, completely wasteful to have straw men. They're, they're, or straw people, they're looking, uh, I, I would guess they're looking at these people uh, all seriously. And then the gender of the interviewers, the, the ratings are you know, AA plus whatever. That's, that's not the RAs, that's the GH Smart has these letter ratings. So there's no um, interpretation on the, the ratings. The interpretation was two things, the RAs um, who, who knew the gender, uh, and then the, the interviewer, some of whom are women, some of whom are not. We get the same results when we use interviewer f uh, fixed effects. So um, that's, you know, to some extent, uh, it's controlling for women. And then, you know, on the, the RA side, uh, I had both men and women RAs, but the, the interesting thing about the, the data is on the, the, the factor side and on the, the how they were perceived, there's, not much, there's no significant gender differences. The only place where there's a significant gender difference is the out of sample thing, which is you know, holding, the, holding the talent constant, and the women were just as talented as the men on the different dimensions.
the women are less likely to become a CEO. So, you know, I don't, the, there, there was, that's a disturbing result, or I don't know if disturbing is the right word, but it's a, it's a result that uh, is, you know, disturbing is as good a word as any. The, there, but in the, the actual data, there's not, there doesn't seem to be anything going on. So, good, thank you.